Praise the Lord. Come on down, Becky. Put your offering in. Give Becky a big hand. <laughs> we love you. Awesome. What a great day. Isn't it wonderful to be a part of something that's changing nations? Hallelujah. It's great to have Leck and Cynthia in the house. They'll be around a little bit more. They're doing a little bit more back and forth um, between Nicaragua and some activities home. So we'll get to see them a little more often. And um, Cynthia is going to be around, I think, while Let goes back and forth some. Let's just agree together real quick. I know it's on their heart, and they've been praying specifically. And I want to, for all of us to agree together that the Lord turn Nicaragua back right side up. It's been upside down. And that as the kingdom advances, it'll go upside down from what it is right now and back to right side up the way it should be, which means some change in government. All right? So let's agree together in the name of Jesus. Lord, you change government. You raise one up and set another down. So we agree together in your perfect timing by your grace. However you want to do it, we agree together that you remove the obstacles spiritually and if necessary, physically, in order to release your purpose, your good thoughts and plans and prosperity for the nation and the people of Nicaragua. In Jesus' name, everybody said together? Amen. Amen. What a tremendous uh, report. And I just can't get over that story, Natalie. Leck? Amen. The end of 40 years. How many of you know 40 years is a end of a season? Right? End of a generation. It's time to turn it over. Hallelujah. So we agree in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Be it so. Um, it's great to have a first time, um, not just guests, but it's great to have first time my grandbaby in the house. Hallelujah. So, I'm a, I'm a proud pops, just saying. No, no, they're, they're situated. Don't disrupt her. You can, they're, they're situated and resting. So, praise the Lord. Are you ready to dive into the word in the time that we have left? Fasten your seatbelt. Hallelujah. Put on your thinking cap and... Let's dive in. Last two weeks ago, I talked to you about the difference between our love for God and His love for us. That the greatest commandment from the Mosaic Covenant is the first and greatest commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, being, love Him, right? Right? But something greater than the commandment for us to love him is his love for us. Today, here's the end of the message today. I'm going to start with the end and then we'll see how far we get to, through the process and we'll end with the end again. The message today is this. It's not about how good we are for him. It's about how good he is for us. We will never be good enough. And we don't please him out of our goodness. He's pleased with us because he's good. So there are two places in scripture that the terminology or the identity of great faith are, is expressed. Uh, Jesus identifies two individuals with great faith in the gospels. How many of you want to have great faith? I want to not just have faith. I want to have great faith. And, and we've had a lot in our culture um, 
in America, really around the world, we've had a lot in our culture about teaching on faith. And we've developed a lot of understanding about faith. Without faith, it's impossible to receive anything from God. Amen? It takes faith to receive. Grace provides, faith receives. It's impossible to receive anything from God apart from faith. But my concern is that we have developed a great amount of faith in faith. We've learned about the mechanics of faith. We've learned about the importance of faith. And we have developed great faith in our faith. But there's something greater than faith in faith. And that is faith in God. So how many of you want to find out about these two individuals in Scripture that were identified as having great faith. All right, real quick, let's, let's not even take the time to look at it. I'm going to trust you and encourage you to go read for yourself, and I'll just tell you two stories. Most of us will be familiar with these two stories. One is found in Matthew chapter 8. The other is found in Matthew chapter 15. The one in Matthew chapter 8 we hear about is the story of the centurion. The centurion, you know, asked Jesus to, to heal his servant who was not on site, and Jesus said, you want me to come lay hands on him? This is Paul's paraphrase. And he said, no, for I'm a man of authority, I'm a man under authority, and I know that I speak to my servant, come, and he comes, go, and he goes, so speak the word only. And so Jesus' response to that was, great at great faith have I, as this have I not seen in Israel. So he identifies that the centurion had great faith. You know, when you read through the Gospels, you can read through them and just come back and give me a report. But I don't remember anywhere in the Gospels that when he was speaking to Israelites, he said anything but be it unto you according to your faith or ye of little faith, or you of no faith. Never does he identify an Israelite with great faith. Okay? Put your mental finger, bookmark that thought, and then let's talk a little bit about Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is in the region of Tyre on the north end of Israel, and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom there. He comes into a house, and in that house, he's having a meal with, with his hosts, and in that house, a woman comes and asks Jesus to heal her daughter, who is demon-possessed. And she is a, in one gospel, she's identified as a Syrophoenician woman, which is another gospel, a Greek woman. She's from that region. She is a Gentile. She's Greek and she's Syrophoenician. So she's ethnically a non-Jew. And Jesus has this discussion and I'm just so amazed because he just is rude to the woman. He says, well, basically, woman, healing is the children's bread. It's not for you. You're outside the Mosaic Covenant. It's for the Israelites. It's a covenant blessing. It's not for you. And she says, says it, it's, it's not even for, for dogs. And she says, and I mean, she calls this woman essentially a dog. So, this woman says, yes, but even the dogs eat from the crumbs, eat the crumbs from the bread that fall under the table when the children eat. And Jesus identifies because of your, and, it, and in two different, in Mark it says one thing, Matthew it says another. Matthew it says, because of your great faith, your daughter is healed. So, there's a couple of things in, the, in both of these instances that I believe line up or, or reveal why it's great faith. So, one is that both healings happen remotely. 
Both healings happen remotely. They don't happen from a touch or the presence. They happen long distance. Because of that, both of the individuals are coming on the behalf of another. They're not coming for their own healing. They're coming on the behalf of another appealing to Jesus. Are you with me? Okay. So they're moved by compassion for someone they care about. A daughter and a servant. The other aspect of this, which I believe is the most important, both are not Jews. But Jesus identifies that they have great faith. So I'm pausing now to let you think. Because this is significant. Because we understand from this side of the cross, we understand what Paul wrote to the Romans, that he says this, the law shuts up faith. And the Jews had been trained, not only in their personal life, but for generations, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years about the law. They had been trained by the law that it was about them becoming pleasing to God. It was about how good they could behave, how good they could be to earn the blessing and the favor of God on their life. They were schooled in the law. It was the mindset. So Jesus, in Mark chapter 7, when Jesus turns to the Syrophoenician woman, and he doesn't use in Mark, Mark doesn't record, record the phrase great faith. He says, because of your response. Most translations say because of your answer, because of your response. The Greek word there that he uses because of your response is the word logon where we get the word logos, that John chapter 1 says Jesus is the logos. He is the word. The logon, the logos, is the, so, uh, Vine's dictionary says it's the whole of the divine expression. It's the logic of God. It's the reasoning of God. It is the message of God. It is the whole summation of who God is and the way God thinks. And he turns to this Greek outside the covenant woman and says, because of your logon, because it's where we get the word logic, because of your logic, your daughter is healed. That's the right answer. <laughs> That's amazing. One place, Matthew records it, is, calls it great faith. Mark records it and calls it, can I call, can I use this phrase, great thinking. The atmosphere just shifted. Two non-believers exercise more faith than the whole nation of Israel. I believe it's because of this one thing. They had heard about who he is. They had heard that he is good. They had heard that he can do miracles. And they took what they heard to be truth. They worshiped other gods. Polytheism. They worshipped other gods, plural, as Roman and as Greek. They worshipped the mythical gods. But they had heard that Jesus was good and that he is healing people. 
And they believed it. And Jesus called it great faith. For us to create, sustain, receive, host a culture of healing, it can never be about how good we are. It can never be about how good we can pray. It can never be about how much effort we put in. It's only about one thing. About him. He loves us. It's not about how much we love him. And he's good. He's so, so good. He's good all the time. He's good everywhere. He is good without any shadow of changing. So James chapter 1 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness. Neither shadow of turning. There's no variation. There's no variable in the equation that will change his goodness. He is good. He is good. He is good. Every good gift for, comes from him. Every gift that he, give, that he gives is a good gift. He is good. He is good. He is good. He doesn't heal one, skip one, and heal another. He doesn't make one healthy and one sick. He doesn't make one whole and teach somebody else something through sin. He is good, he is good, he is good. When revealing his name and his nature, when Moses asked to see the glory of God, he wasn't asking to see a light show. He was asking to see the nature and the expression and the, 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 the essence, the ness of who he is. God revealed himself in Exodus chapter 34. It says, The Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord, Yahweh. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, which means I am, I am. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger abounding in love and in faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. And the implication there is generations, to thousands of generations, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. He forgives. He is gracious. He is compassionate. His name is compassion. His name is goodness. His name is healing. Hallelujah. In Exodus 15, in talking, in, in revealing himself to the nation of Israel, he declares when they came out of Egypt to the waters of Merah, which means bitterness, and they, could, they were thirsty. They'd been traveling through the wilderness. They needed some water. But the waters were bitter, were bitter, and the Lord told Moses to throw a tree into the waters, and they were made sweet. It sucked all the bitterness out. Um, Yes, amen. Isn't that just cool? So that's a picture of throwing the cross into the middle of the bitterness, the bitter waters of our life. Jesus is the cross that was thrown in, and it sucks the bitterness out of our life. And the Lord said there in response to that, he said, I am Yahweh, the Lord who heals you. I am Jehovah Rophe, the God, your healer. I am the healing God. I am the God who heals. Every Everything about me is healing. Nothing about me is destructive. Nothing about me puts sickness or disease or pain on people. I am the God who heals. I'm not the God who takes. I'm not the God who destroys. I'm the God who heals. 
Psalms 105 verse 17 tells us, He brought out Israel laden with silver and gold. That's a pretty cool way to leave town. (laughs) And from among their tribes, no one, everybody say one, no one faltered. King James says there was not one feeble one among them. Three million people and no one faltered. Three million people, none were weak. Three million people marching out of a city, all healed, all whole, all strong, all well able, no cancer, no bum knees, no back issues, no heart issues, all healed. Three million people. If that can happen under the Mosaic Covenant, what do you think would happen if we had a people who believed the new covenant based on better promises, a better sacrifice, a better high priest? What could happen if we believe God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do and did what he said he did? What would happen if we took God at his word? I believe he's looking for a people who will just simply believe, simply trust, simply take what he said and then take it to the world. Ah! I have so far to go and no time to get there. But we have other days. So our worship team is coming. And our auditorium hosts are getting in place. Just ready to serve us. Because Psalms 105 tells us the observation, the picture of what happened the way they came out of Egypt. But guess what happened the night before? A massive healing service. Let me just tell you statistically, you don't have three million people when nobody sit in the natural. But the night before they walked out where no one faltered, they slaughtered a lamb. And they took bread with no leaven. And they took wine. And they sat down. They got dressed ready to go. And they sat down and they had a meal. It's called the Passover meal. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, on Thursday night before his crucifixion, sat down with his disciples to have the same meal. And he said, this is my body. And he broke the bread. He said, take, eat this. You know what? I, I, one, one just really cool little detail that I read this week is that, that bread, it's, it's, it's Passover bread. It's called matzah bread. That bread to this day, the, most Israelites, most Jewish people don't understand why. But the way the, the instructions to make the bread is that you don't add any leaven. Leaven represents um, sin in the Old Covenant. You don't add in any leaven. You have flour. You roll it all. You, you have um, water. You roll it all out. And then guess what you do? You pierce it. And you stripe it. And you bake it, burn it. Jesus, before he was pierced, before he was striped, took that bread, he broke it, said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Later, the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, talking about 
the Lord's Supper and he says, for this reason, many among you have, have gotten sick and died early because you did not discern the Lord's body. And he's talking about communion and he says about communion that the Lord took the bread, which is his body, and he broke it and he said, take, eat all of you of this. Why? Because he's referring back to what Isaiah spoke forward to. Isaiah the prophet, 400 years before Jesus the Messiah came, spoke in Isaiah 53. And he says that he bore our sicknesses and our diseases, our griefs and our sorrow. He took them up. He was pierced and wounded. Pierced for our transgressions, wounded for our iniquities, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the punishment of our peace was upon him. He took on himself. And that bread is the type, the picture, the point of contact. It says his body took. My weakness. So just imagine across, uh, uh, across the valley of where the Hebrews lived in Egypt and they're eating lamb and they're breaking bread and they're drinking wine, not even fully understanding the symbolism of it. And yet while they eat, legs got straight while they ate hearts were healed while they ate diabetes was cured while they ate you name it until they were all healed and the morning of they came out and no one faltered no one was in pain they walked out under their own strength. Really, it's a bad phrase. They walked out under God's strength. All healed. If time, if time afforded us, I would read for you throughout the Gospels every Time it identified that Jesus, who is the representative of God the Father, the exact image and representation, Jesus, it says, Jesus healed them all. It identifies specific healings that were remarkable and cool, but the writers of the Gospels couldn't record. Even John says the books couldn't, the world couldn't contain the books of all the amazing things Jesus did. So what we do is we just say he healed them all. They came from the region ever all around and he healed them all. He healed them all. He healed every sickness. He healed every disease. He healed them all, all the people. He delivered them from the demonic. Acts 10 38 says he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power went about doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil listen the question to, to myself the question to us is do we judge God by our circumstances or do we judge our circumstances by our God As we go forward, not today, we'll talk a little bit about the challenge of intellectual offense when our experience hadn't lined up with the truth because there's a difference between fact and truth. That's not for today, but here's the problem. Our problem is if we choose to live by facts rather than by truth. Our problem is if we change our image of who he is based on our experience. It doesn't matter if I experience the fullness of the truth. It doesn't change who he is. He is good. He is always good. And he heals them all because he healed them all. 
So on the way home after, after Perian's preach last week, the Holy Spirit gave me this phrase. He just said it to me, and I share it with you because I think you should get the good of it. He said the, he, the healing of God is in the atonement, not in the moment. See, you and I were healed 2,000 years ago when Jesus hung on the cross and he took up our sicknesses and our diseases according to Isaiah 53, according to 1 Peter 2.24. Our healing does not happen when we feel different. Our healing happened there. Our healing happened at the atonement. Thank God when I feel different. But thank God before I feel different. The manifestation does not make it true or real. The manifestation just makes it a manifestation. So so our thinking has to change so that our language can change so we don't say, I'm believing for God to heal me because he already healed me. I may be looking for the manifestation to show up in my body, but I was healed 2,000 years ago based on what Jesus did at the cross. Anything less than that, anything less than that, anything less than that is a slap in the face of the sacrifice that he made and the suffering that he took. See, I want to see the people of God have the fullness of what he paid for. That his suffering is not in vain. And not only the people of God, but the world, because he bought it for all mankind. He bought it not only for the Jews, but for the Greeks, and I qualify. <laughs> so I asked the Holy Spirit today, okay, Holy Spirit, and I do this, really. I'd say, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? Show me, I, Jesus, where are you? What are you doing? I just want to do what you want to do. I want to do what I see you do. What are you doing? Where, where are you today? What are you healing? And I just try to press in and allow him to reveal to me anything specific. And he does that. We've seen uh, people uh, a few weeks ago on the left side, we've seen people get breakthrough um, in healing in their bowels and in pain in their left side. And uh, before that, there's been other things, words of knowledge, things that are specific are awesome. So I was asking the Holy Spirit, what do you want to do? And he said, why don't you do what, what you're preaching? I said, what do you mean? He says, I thought you're preaching that I healed them all. What would happen if we believed the truth? Because it is the truth. We'd all be healed. Not one feeble one among us. I think it's really necessary that we be that bold. Like it's really necessary that we declare it. Because what we are not, what we're timid about, we, we are not going to get. But what we're clear about, what we're bold about, is where, how we press into the reality of what Jesus has already paid for. So somebody stand up with me today as we prepare to receive the payment of what he did on our behalf by faith. Hallelujah. So on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. We have this little wafer that needs some piercing and some stripes on it. Let's just break it. Because his body was broken that we might be made whole. The same sacrifice that paid for the forgiveness of our sin also paid for the healing of our bodies. Even the promise of Psalms says... As your days, so shall your strength be. It's God's will that we end our days in strength. Not in weakness. So, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat. 
in remembrance. And another word for remembrance is to remember, to put the pieces together, the logic that it was done for you. So let's partake of the bread as we receive today. And just begin to give thanks. Father, I thank you for healing in my body. I thank you that your body was broken for me. That no sickness, no disease, no weakness can stay in my body. No ailment, no illness because your body was broken. Because you took away sickness, disease, infirmity, ailment, pain, grief, sorrow. You removed it from me by taking my place. And you took it to the cross. So it's no longer mine. I no longer have pain. I no longer have disease. I no longer have. It's not mine. I don't own it. You took it. And because of what you did, I'm made whole. So I receive your wholeness. I receive healing in my body. I receive your wholeness in me today. Uh, I declare all symptoms have to shift and change according to the healing that's in me. In this moment and in the moments and the hours and the days and the weeks to come, I declare that the atonement prevails over my moments. I declare the healing power of God prevails. The truth prevails over, my, over the facts of my symptoms or my feelings. In Jesus' name. Just make those de- kinds of declarations over your life right now. Thank you, Lord, that you healed them all. You healed them all. You heal us all. You're so, so good. It's not about how good we are. It's not about us pleasing you. You're pleased because of Jesus. His obedience was ours. You love us. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood. Shed for the remission of sin, for the forgiveness of sin. He said, take, drink, you all of it. Drink all of it. Don't hold back. Just keep drinking of my forgiveness. First John 1 9 tells us that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who forgives us of all of our sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's His blood that continually washes and cleanses not just our spirit man but through our soul through our body from all unrighteousness. Anything that's not right according to the kingdom of God, He cleanses. So Lord we partake of Your cup. We partake of Your blood today in Jesus name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to give thanks. Just give thanks. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for healing. Thank you, Lord, for cleansing. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free. Thank you, Lord, that you you wash over me. You wash over me. Thank you. Yeah, just let a new song arise to the Lord.
this atmosphere keep playing something else we want to do that we believe is not an official in the natural it's an official in the spirit thing to do in the spirit we we call it setting an order to lay hands on somebody to set them into an office and Last week, I made the announcement that Tabitha Denny has been serving on our vision team for uh, the last year and a half. Come down. Yeah, come up here. Brian, why don't you come with me? And then I'm going to ask our vision team to just come around the front right now. She's been serving for the last year and a half as a part of our vision team. Our, we call it a vision team because we believe our primary responsibility is to receive the Father's vision for us as a church and to watch over that vision and, and watch over the flock as we walk out that vision together. And so it, in the New Covenant, biblical terms, elders, presbyteros, lots of terms that would apply that mean overseers. And that's a spiritual office that is not just a governmental in the natural with the state of Texas. You understand what I'm saying? It's not a board member. There is that legal aspect in our nation but this is about authority in the realm of the Spirit. And Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus about specific instructions. An aspect of that was to not lay hands on someone suddenly or quickly without them being proven. And that's why we allow them to serve for a season and for everybody to observe their ministry. We can honestly say that we've observed Tabitha's ministry growing up in this house. A little bit over two years ago, the Lord gave us a very clear visionary word to begin to re release and move and advance the next generation to roles of leadership as we do life and lead together and we expand generations and so we've been intentional to do that over the last couple of years that's when we added Joe we added Matt we added Cliff um, to the vision team and uh, Tab has been faithfully serving everything from leading worship hospitality as well as serving on the vision team the last year and a half but two years ago in that meeting at our 30th anniversary I saw something very specific prophetically about Tab and Tab's gifted and, uh, and anointed how many of you realize we're all gifted and anointed in our own unique ways but there's something on Tab that is the heart of a pastoral mantle that the Lord just told me that I'm to pass on to her And 
uh, so it's it's in the spirit. I mean, how many of you realize you can get a word and don't have to give it every in the moment you get it? So I've hold, held that word for two and a half years now. And uh, I think of Catherine Kuhlman, who the Lord gave her three people to pass on her and that, her mantle to. So that's something you don't just give to anybody. It may not be exclusive to one. But I can stand here with confidence and clarity by the Holy Ghost and say that Tab is one. And when you pass when you when you pass on a mantle, when you put a mantle on, you're not just imparting but you're calling forth gifts that are already there. There's an activation and an anointing and there's a, okay, so a quick picture of that is in the the priesthood of under the Mosaic law as when one generation would pass it to the next, they'd take the high priest would take the robe off that had the anointing that he received and he'd put it on the next priest and then they would add that their own anointing for that priest and so it had the anointing of previous generations but then it had their own anointing added to it I'm going to keep my shirt on (laughs) she knows I'm liable to take my shirt off now I'm really tempted I almost brought my blue blazer because I was wearing my blue blazer um, that night. Because I, th- I did tell Perry Ann. Um, so you'll just have to suffice with me putting my arm around you. But. But the Lord did tell me. Oh, here. Don't keep. No, 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 no. Thank you. It's not going on her until it goes on me. It's too big for me. Give her a big hand. Thank you, Daniel. So, um, as as I was listening to the Holy Spirit about that. Um, <laughs> he said there's some, a lot, something a whole lot more important than even the symbol, symbolism of, of a blue blazer. And that is a mantle that the Lord gave to Perry Ann and I in the early days of our, of our life together. Um, and that is a worldview, a concept, an experience of the presence of God that we dove into this guy named E.W. Kenyon that was the foundation of our life. And this is a book called In His Presence. And it's held together by rubber bands because we have literally immersed ourselves in this book and it is coming apart. Um, maybe you can get it re-glued. I don't know, but it's, um, it's not in print. You have a better copy, but I want to give her my copy. Uh, you can give me your copy. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of, I was really kind of holding on to it, like it's gonna go out of my library. You can't get any more of these. Thank you. I get Darlene's copy. So it's it's got things. It's got it's got uh, it's really about it's it's got topics in here about how. Be who you are and to carry the anointing of his presence in all that you are and all that you do. Whether it's leading worship, whether it's preaching a message, whether it's burping a baby, whether it's playing with your husband in the swimming pool. You do it with an anointing and a mantle of the presence of God and and an authority in the spirit. It's some chapters in here on intercession about how to pray and release the authority of heaven for other people. And I just want to give you my hour, my mantle. 
in the spirit. Stretch out your hands towards Tab. Vision team, just gather around. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the gifts and the callings. Not only that you've added to us, but you've raised up in our midst. And Father, today we lay hands on, on Tabitha as she steps into the fullness of an office in the realm of the Spirit and the authority on her life is engaged and activated in ways that it has never been before. Things that she's thought, things that she's carried, things that she's wondered about now become her habit. Realms of anointing, prophetic flow, releasing the presence and the power of God to others. words of knowledge and insight about the flock that she intercedes as well as oversees in agreement together we receive her as a shepherd as a bishop as a pastor in this house In the name of Jesus and everybody that receives her as one of the pastoral overseers, say yes, yes. and amen. amen. Hallelujah. a part of the family of God and stand if you're a first time guest with us today if you're new among us we're a family and this is who we are and this is what we do and what creates a safe place of heaven on earth to be able to minister we would love to greet you personally if you're a first time guest with us today um, our leadership team's going to slide out to our left and your right through the double doors. We have a gift for you and just want to shake your hand and say thank you. Our Abbey prayer partners, we have people that are available to pray with you. If you do not know that you're born again, that you're a son or a daughter of the Father, they are here to pray with you. Don't go home without that security and assurance in your heart that you have been welcomed home in the family. So... Hallelujah, we have two Abbey prayer partners here. We need more Abbey prayer partners over here. Thank you. And our worship team's going to sing us out. I declare over you that you are blessed, you are healed, and you're released in Jesus' name. I bless you. Serve it, still you give me.
deserve it still 